All right, go ahead and find a seat. We'll get started. It's good to see you here this morning. Welcome to North Village Church. Uh, uh, myself, my wife, and a, and a team of us were in, uh, in Mexico City last uh, week. So there's a picture of us with the pastor and his family uh, at, their, at their church. And it was just so fun. Like, we're worshiping the Lord, you know, 1030 on Sunday. You were doing that here on, on Sunday. And, and uh, just seeing what the Lord is doing in Mexico was, was a blessing. We'll have the team come up during the announcements. But make every effort to learn uh, you know, how the experience went for uh, the people on, on this team, it'll be a, be a blessing. Uh, we do also have tablets we pass to the, to the aisle. That's a way to stay connected as a church family. So if uh, Natalie, Holly, if you guys can get that going, that's just a, 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 a way to check in. That's how our elders pray for our church family and, and uh, super thankful uh, for you uh, utilizing that, that resource. Uh, this morning, we're going to continue our series called One Year later, right? And, and it's the whole idea of like a year ago, we took the step of faith to move in uh, to this building, to build it out uh, right in the midst of a pandemic, not really sure uh, what was, was going to happen. And, and then, you know, like over the last year, there's been a, a roller coaster of events just like there is uh, every year, right? I mean, the pandemic was kind of start, stop, start, like it's over. No, it's back. Like, you know, you had, you had that uh, going on. We had our yearly focus of look around. We we're going to, you know, continue to, to look out for those that uh, were, were in the midst of the pandemic and care for those who are walking in the door, exploring North Village Church. And then our, our challenge of uh, three circles, of sharing the three circles, the gospel uh, uh, to the people around us. So we, we had that going on. We had, uh, <clears throat> we had some people leave our church family during the, the last year. Um, move out of Austin. We, we did some open houses uh, where we invited people into the community to, to see uh, what was going on with North Village Church. We had just last Sunday, Pastor Keith, last Sunday. All right, so when we look back on the last year, it's a, it's a roller coaster of events. Like some of those things were planned. We, we were praying, ready for those things to happen. Some of those things were surprises. Uh, we were like, what? I didn't know that was going to happen. Uh, but that's what happens in, in all of life. And no matter the roller coaster, no matter the changes, right, that, that our vision is the same. Our purpose is the same. And so this is our, our vision as a, as a church family, that, that we are a family, uh, meaning that we want to have deep relationships with one another and that we're going to place Jesus at the center of our lives, meaning that he's Lord. He's, he's the decision maker. We run all things through uh, Jesus. And, and, and what we believe is that when, when Jesus is at the center of our lives and when we're in deep relationships with one another, that we'll be compelled, we'll be moved out to chase after every man, woman, and child in greater Austin to experience the life-transforming power of Jesus. Like That's, that's our vision. As a church family, I hope when you see that, no matter the circumstances in the headlines and at the personal level or the global level, I hope there's a part of you that, that resonates with that. Like what, what, a, what a blessing it is to be a part of a church family that's chasing after those things. I hope our, our pulse, you know, just like, oh, this is really special what we have at, at North Village Church. I hope there's a, a part of us that looks at... Um, that vision and, and thinks to ourselves, like, how's that going to happen? Like, how, how, is, how is North Village Church going to, you know, touch the lives of 2 million people in greater Austin? You ever think about that? Just like, greater Austin? Like, that's a, that's a lot of people. How's that going to happen? Well, I'm glad you asked, right? Well, one is we're going to partner with established churches. So we're not trying to get every person, all 2 million, into this building, right? We want to partner with established churches. So what that means is that once a month, I meet with four other pastors in this geographical area. We pray for our church family, pray for our city, pray for, for one another. And in addition to that, we also partner with about 40 other churches around greater Austin. So we're not trying to get everybody into North Village Church, but we do want to invite everybody in Austin into the kingdom and that the, the body of Christ, that these churches would be salt and lights around our city. So we absolutely believe in partnering with established churches, but we also want to plant new churches. How's our vision going to, going to happen? Well, we're going to partner with established and we're going to plant new churches. That's how we were started. 15 people gathered in, into our living room and, and North Village Church was birthed out of that. So we're firm believers in starting new churches. So in the life of North Village Church, we've been able to help a church get started on the other side of Mopac, uh, up in uh, Leander. And then right now, we're financially supporting in Round Rock a Spanish-speaking church because 
We absolutely believe in starting new churches. The third part of our, 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 our ownership of that vision is our personal ownership. So this is where everybody in this room, this is where we get involved, right? Where we start to think about like, okay, so how do we live out that vision personally? So we, we want to have Jesus at the center of our lives. That's what Pastor Keith talked about last Sunday. That's not just like formulaic or a nice thing to to, to say or to, to think, we absolutely uh, believe that Jesus has to be at the center of our lives. So he's the one that's carrying us through the volatility of our day. That he's the one who's taken our death at the cross. That he's the one who's conquered it in the resurrection. That he's the one leading us and guiding us into eternity. We want to have Jesus at the center of our lives. And then this morning we're going to talk about family being critical. And then next Sunday we're going to talk about chasing Chasing after others. That I hope on some level that that's, that's a captivating thought for us to, to chase after others, to demonstrate and declare uh, the name of Jesus. But this is our, our vision as a church family. So let's talk about family. That's where we are, are this morning. Let's talk about family. Like the idea of family. Family is easy to put on a wall. Like we are, we are a family. It sounds nice, you know, like something you pick up at Hobby Lobby. Like, oh, yeah, family, right? But family is... Family's hard, right? I mean, having a family, building a family, building a church family, like that's hard. It's easy to kind of go do what you want to do when you want to do it, where you want to do it. That's easy, right? It's easy to commit your life to building a career. It's easy to just become self-consumed, right? That's easy. It's hard. It's hard to build family. It's hard. Like, even as a church family, like, it's easy to just walk in and attend a worship service. That's easy, right? right? It's easy to, to, to have just surface-level conversation, like, you know, our little meet and greet. How was your week? Ah, oh, it's good. How's yours? Oh, you know, those groceries. Yeah. All right, see you next Sunday. That's easy. That's easy. It's easy to find one or two people that are comfortable and just kind of focus on those two people, right? But it's hard to build family. It's hard. It's hard to build family. So that's what we're going we're gonna to talk about this morning, right? We're going to look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We're going to see three subpoints: God's plan. Jesus saves until then, right? Drake's going to show up here in this first one. God's plan. God's plan. Grab that devotional. Turn to page 245. Our new devotional should arrive next week. They're so pretty. I'm so excited about them. All right, let's look at verses 9, 10, and 11, 1 Thessalonians. For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we will live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build up one another just as you are also doing. All right, let me give you some context to 1 Thessalonians to help us get on the same page, right? So the 1 Thessalonians is written by the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul comes to faith in Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9, he comes to faith in Jesus. Life is radically transformed in Jesus. Acts chapter 13, he is sent out to proclaim the name of Jesus all over the Roman Empire so that by Acts 17, Paul, Silas, and Timothy roll into Thessalonica, and they start proclaiming the name of Jesus. People come to faith, and a new church is started, right? That's, that's the context of 1 Thessalonians. That's what we were doing when we were in Mexico. Uh, this is a, a map of uh, where Thessalonians. You guys know where that is, though. This is us in Mexico City, right? We would, uh, we would walk around in broken Spanish, and uh, we would ask people if we could pray for them. We would try to have a conversation with them about, about Jesus. And like 80% of the people would Pray for, uh, let us pray for them in, in broken Spanish. And then, and then these two teenage boys, they actually followed us back. They, like, chased us down. They're like, hey. And, and, and we try to have a conversation with them. And they, they come back to the church 
where we're staying, and they meet the pastor. The pastor has a musical background. These teenage boys have a musical background, and we connected them together. And I don't know what's going to happen in that relationship, but like what we were doing in Mexico City, what we do in Austin, that's the same thing they were doing in Thessalonica 2,000 years ago. Right? So when you look at Scripture, we're not talking about an ancient document of like what people used to do. People come to faith in Jesus in the first century. Their lives are living for him. And the same thing in 2022. We come to faith in Jesus and we live for him. So in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9, the apostle Paul writes, For God has not destined us for wrath, right? Because the Thessalonians, they're living in hardships. They had challenges then, just like we do today. They had struggles then, just like we do today. They had idols of worship then, just like we we do today. And so they could get discouraged. That's what happens for us today, right? Life gets difficult. Life gets challenged. We get discouraged. We get disheartened. So he's reminding them, for God has not destined us for wrath. right? And you see that phrase, destined us for wrath. At first glance, it could be a little bit confusing, right? Because like the, the... that the hardship, it's not just the temporal hardship. He's talking about the eternal judgment of God. And at first glance, it could sound like, well, maybe, maybe God's wrath isn't going to happen. Like maybe, maybe God's just about love. Maybe, maybe it's just like all kind of warm fuzzies. That, that's what the God of Scripture is, a, is about. But Scripture is reminding it. Like, like you need to know, like God's wrath like when he says that, for God has not destined us for wrath, no, please don't think that God's wrath is a bad thing. I mean, God's wrath is to, to hold evil and injustice and corruption accountable. Like, I mean, God's wrath is necessary. Like the wrath of God, the, 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 the judgment of God on, on the evil and corruption of this world we, we absolutely want that to happen. I mean, if you think about it, if I invite you over to my house this afternoon and we're all there having a good time, and then somebody shows up with a baseball bat and just starts welling on people, right? We, we wouldn't want to all kind of stand in a circle and go, well, let's all be loving. Let's let them express themselves in creative ways. Let's not, you know, hinder their, their self-expression, right? No, you would be like, Michael, do something. Somebody, somebody stop. Like, we would want to hold that person accountable to stop the, the destruction. That's exactly what's, what he's describing here in, in, in verse 9, is that, that, that God's wrath is a, is a good thing. And what we need to remember is that the, the evil and corruption of this world, it isn't just out there, right? The evil and corruption of this world is in here. It's in our hearts, that we're sinners, that, that, that we're broken, like that, that we also are, are being subjected to, to God's wrath. And so this is his plan. So he's reminding us for, from the very beginning is that, that for, for God has not destined us for wrath, right? He's trying to encourage them that any hardship we experience at the temporal level or at the eternal level, like that God's plan is that we're not left alone in that wrath, right? But that he has come to bring rescue. He's come to bring salvation. So let's look at our second subpoint: Jesus saves. All right? Remember, we're talking about the importance of family. I haven't forgotten that. We'll get to the family. But let's just let's follow this, this train of thought here in 1 Thessalonians. It says, for God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us. Look at that phrase. I mean, so just think about that. Like, are we deserving of his judgment? Yeah. All of humanity is deserving of God's wrath. The culture isn't going to teach us that. The culture is going to teach us, teach our children that we're basically good people and we just need to try hard. But what Scripture teaches is that we're all deserving of God's wrath. And we want God's wrath to come. We want the accountability for the injustice and the corruption and the evil of this world. But the good news right there, verse 9 and 10, the good news is that Jesus has come to take the judgment that we deserve Upon himself at the cross. Does that make sense? That Jesus has has lived the perfect life and that he has willingly laid down his life at the cross so that God's wrath would be poured out on him in our place so that we might have life. As you may be sitting here this morning, you're like, I thought we were talking about family. We are. We are. Like, but like, 
what's going to hold us together is, is not like our natural affinity for one another. Like what, what bonds us together as family is it's the cross, right? What's going to move us to overcome the challenges and the hiccups and the hardships of the day, it's not our perseverance, right? It's not our education. It's not our fortitude. It's the cross. And so when we talk about family, like we have to start off talking about the cross. I mean, that phrase, just zero in on that. I wish we had more time to spend on it. But that our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us. I mean, when Jesus dies on the cross for our sin, it's not um, like just a, a martyr-like mentality, right? right? We're, we're, we're like, we're, you know, he, he's like, I'll take the hit for everybody else, and, and I believe in the cause so much, I'll, I'll lay my life down. He's not a martyr, right? He's not an example of, of love, of like somebody who's really committed, and we need to be committed like Jesus. No, when Jesus when Jesus dies on the cross, what scriptures teach you, he dies for us. He dies in our place, that he is our substitute, that he takes the judgment, he takes the wrath, that there is wrath, that there is judgment. And the good news of the gospel is that Jesus has come to take that judgment upon himself at the cross for all who believe in him. That's what unites us is family that's why we're we're committed to one another it's because of the cross it's because Jesus saves and that's true for every one of us who call on his name that's why in 2 Corinthians he writes he who knew no sin that's Jesus he knew no sin he lived a perfect life he became sin right he took our sin at the cross so that we might know the righteousness of God that's why every one of us can have relationship with one another Because every one of us are in that same place. Every one of us, he took the wrath that we deserved. We are all sinners who have been saved by grace. And that's what unites us as family. That's why we're committed to one another as family. I've shared this illustration uh, before, uh, but it's worth repeating, is that this this old illustration of this pastor, his uh, wife has passed away. His children, are, 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 they attend the funeral. They've lost their, their mom. And, and on the way home, this pastor with his children uh, is grieving the loss of his wife. The children are grieving the loss of uh, their mom. And he's trying to think of something to encourage his children, right? To, to walk through the challenge and the difficulty of, of the day. And so as he's driving, he sees the diesel, the truck is driving. And, and then... And then below the diesel, there's the, there's the shadow of the truck. And so he says to his children, he's like, hey, guys, do you see the, you see the diesel? And they're like, yeah. He's like, do you see the shadow? And they're like, yeah. And he's like, would, 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 you, would, you, rather, would you rather be struck, be hit by the diesel of the sh- truck, or would you rather be struck, would you rather go through the shadow and, of course, the, the kids are like, we'd rather go through the, through the shadow. And he's like, that's why Jesus is so important. Like, when we talk about, when we talk about mom, we talk about what we've lost, we need to remember that, that Jesus has taken the truck of death upon himself so that mom only had to go through the shadow, right, so that mom can be eternally with him. And that's why Jesus is so important to our church family, right? That's what unites us together, Right, that, that he has taken the death that we deserve. That's why we talk about the three-circle challenge, talking about the gospel. I mean, we're, we're focused on this three circles until the end of August. Right? It is, it's a challenge to hear the three-circle gospel presentation. It's a challenge to share the gospel uh, with somebody in our church family and outside of our church family. And so we're inviting our church family to respond to that challenge. Right, to, to learn how to share the gospel, to, 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 to bring up the glorious good news that for God has not destined us for wrath. Right? No matter the hardships and challenges of our day, he's not left us alone in that. But instead, for salvation, through Christ Jesus our Lord, he dies for us. Church family, that's what unites us. That's what we want to share. Until then, let's talk about our third sub-point. 
Until then, until we're face-to-face with Jesus, how are we supposed to engage this, this challenge of family? Look at verse 11. It says, therefore, in light of verses 9 and 10, in, in light of the challenges and the hardships that we're going to experience in life, we're going to feel like God has abandoned us. He's not, he's not destined us for wrath, but, but for, for salvation in Christ. So therefore, encourage one another and build up one another just as you are also doing. You see what he's doing there in 1 Thessalonians. He's, he's inviting the, the Thessalonian church to look at one another like, don't get too, too distracted by the hardships and the challenges, but, like, but like, remember what we have in Christ and then remember what we have in one another. That word encourage in the original language is the same word as to comfort. Right, so he's just acknowledging there's hardships, there's challenges. And so remember what we have in Christ and then encourage one another, like actively looking around the room, knowing who are the partners of our church family, who are committed to this church family, and then thinking to ourselves, how can I be encouraging to this church family? How can I comfort this church family? How can I be building up this church family? I mean, keep in mind, this isn't talking about mass communication, it's, it's a one another. Like literally in the original language, it's one to one. Like it's, it's not technically what I'm doing this morning to, to a group of people, but it's what we do to one another, one to one. For we who are in Christ to be, to be taking God's call on our lives, the, the vision we have of being a family, it's not going to happen Magically, And so God's inviting us to take ownership of that, of just like, okay, what does that look like? That I'm actively planning to encourage. I don't know about you, but I don't just spontaneously encourage. You can talk to my wife, talk to my children. I'm like a problem solver. So I'm always thinking about what's wrong and how can I fix it, right? I'm, that's what I naturally do. And so for me to encourage, I have to plan to courage, encourage. I have to think about how am I going to encourage these people? And I pray and I ask the Lord, like, help me. You don't want to just say, like, you're awesome. Hey, bud, you're awesome. You know, you're like, to, to speak the words of life, to speak encouragement, to comfort. Hmm, to comfort. I mean, we can't get by with, like, a, a, a five-minute, like, shallow conversation on a Sunday morning, right? If we're going to genuinely live out God's call of comforting one another, right? I mean, we're... We're going to have to be present. We're going to have to listen. That's hard. <laughs> We're going to have to not look around the room to see what everybody else is doing, but to like eye on. Like We're going to have to spend time with each other, like in community groups, organically connecting, organizationally connecting, all of it. Because like if we're going to comfort, like that's, that takes an incredible amount of intentionality. Therefore, encourage comfort to build up one another. This is the call we have, church family. This is the opportunity uh, we have to, to build up one another in Christ, to remind one another of the gospel that we just talked about, that we're going to feel despair and discouragement. Oh, God's not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation in Christ Jesus our Lord, who died for us. If he died for us, he's not going to abandon us now. And so we speak the gospel over one another, over and over and over as much as we can to remind, like, oh, that's error. Don't, don't believe that. Turn and believe the gospel. That's how we have family. This is such a, an opportunity for us right now as a church family because the reality is, is that you know, over the last six months, like, we've had some... Uh, some people move out of our church family that, that, that honestly, they're, they're kind of relational anchors to our church family. I mean, God blessed us with some people that were living out verse 11. There's nothing like inherently special about those people. I mean, they're special, you know, in God's image. But I'm just saying like there's nothing, like they, they don't have like some superpower that the rest of us don't have. Like they just simply, they, they heard God's call on their lives. They saw our vision. They re- responded to it. And in God's grace, it, 
we saw fruit of that. Praise God for that. We're thankful for that. But he's moved them on outside of our city. And so now the opportunity is for us who are here to look around the room and think, how am I going to be the relational anchor for North Village Church? How is God going to move in me to create heart streams like, with the people in this church family? Yes, it's supernatural. It's God's grace. It's the Holy Spirit. We're desperate for him, absolutely. But it's also us intentionally hearing God's word, applying it to our lives, and leaning into it. And listen, I, I think this is a real challenge for us, not just because we've had some relational anchors move out, but because of just going through the pandemic. Like, I don't know about you guys. Maybe you all navigated it better than I did, but like, I feel like I kind of forgot like, how to do some relational things. You know, for like two years, we kind of just, you know, the, the idea was to not talk to people. <laughs> and you do something for two years, you kind of build up some habits, Right. And here lately, the Lord's just like leaning in on me and like, I mean, just last week, I was kind of praying with the Lord and I'm kind of thinking like, have I forgot how to hang out with people? Like, I kind of just processing that with the Lord. You ever think about like, I don't know if I know how to hang out with people anymore. Like, I know how to do like a formal meeting. You know, you're supposed to show up at a certain time. And like, I, okay, I'm doing that. But like, I feel like before the pandemic, I used to just kind of hang out with people. And so I'm learning, I'm learning like how to do nothing. You can help me. Michael, you want to do nothing together. Like we need to do that. Do that with each other. Like you want to hang out. Like, oh yeah, I like to hang out. It's fun. But you forget, you forget how to, how to do that. And so that's the real challenge for us right now as a church family. To respond to the, to the truth of God's word. To encourage. To comfort. To build up. Because listen to me, our ultimate desire is not this building. We're thankful for the building. We're thankful for the space. But that's not what ignites our hearts. The space is just an opportunity for us to become family. And so I, I just want to invite, invite you into that. To make that commitment. Just bring it down to like base level. Well, I'm going to commit to being there on Sunday mornings. You're here. You're already living it out, right? That's the first step, right? I'm going to commit to being in a community group. I'm going to commit to, to making a point of knowing people's names. That's really what it comes down to. It's just a commitment. I'm going to make a commitment to talking to people I don't know. I'm, I'm going to make a commitment of, of forgiving people, right? Because if, if we start actually talking to each other, eventually we're going to offend one another. <laughs> it's going to happen. We're sinners. And so I'm going to make a commitment that when you offend me, well, we're, we're going to reconcile. We're going to forgive. It's making a commitment of being honest. How you doing? Good. How you doing? Good? Good. Good. See you next week. Good, right? <laughs> All right, that happens sometimes. That's, that's all right. But, but periodically, going beyond the good. I'm like, oh, here, you know, here's what's going on. This is a challenge. This is what's good. This is where, where I'm struggling. Right? That's, that's what it is. It, it's, it's just making a commitment. It's resisting the, the, the pushback of, like, well, I'm not good with people. Right? We do that sometimes. Right? I'm not good with people. I'm introverted. That's what we say to ourselves sometimes. I'm kind of shy. Right? But imagine if we apply that, like, to our immediate family. I mean, can you imagine if our immediate family walked up to us and they were like, hey, do you want to you hang out? And we said to our immediate family, I'm kind of shy. Like, to our children, to our spouse, I'm introverted. Right? We would never do that, right? <laughs> and so that's the challenge for us to think about, like, well, how do we do that with one another? It doesn't mean we're all going to be best friends, have sleepovers. I mean, maybe. Maybe we end up doing that, just get a commune you know, communal living situation going. That's probably not the goal. But it does mean like over, uh, you know, after, after six months of being in a church family, you know each other's names. You know, after six months, you're, you're divulging parts of your life that other people didn't know, right? Because we're family. 
Man, won't you, won't you respond to that this morning? Respond not to me, to God's word to encourage and comfort and build up one another. I'll close with a, a story. Uh, um, my family and I, we've been going through, I've shared a little bit, to foster uh, children. It's a long process. We started in January. And uh, here in August, we're opening up our door, so any minute now we could have a kid uh, coming into our home. So we're excited and nervous uh, about that. Um, throughout the training, uh, the, the leaders would oftentimes say, you should also get approved for adoption, right, to adopt uh, children. And, and we prayed about it, we thought about it, and we said to them, like, hey, that's really not our call, like calling in this process of, of adoption. We really want to foster. And they're like, oh, but you really should because you've gone through the training. It's just a piece of paper. Like, why don't you consider? And we, and we pushed back again. We had to push back, you know, a little more, like, no, 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 no. Like, and we had to explain, like, no, 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 it, it, adoption is great. We believe in adoption. But for us personally, what the Lord is, is calling us to do is just to, is to foster, is to, to take in these ch- children for a season so that, if possible, we want to get them back with mom and dad. Like, if it's safe for these kids to go back to mom and dad, if that's at all an option, like, that's what we're excited about, that's what we're committed to, we want to get those kids back to mom and dad because, because we believe in family. Right, because we know at the core of their hearts, like that kid wants to be with mom and dad. And so like, if we can be helpful in any ways to help them get back to their, their mom and dad, that's really what we're, we're most passionate about. Right? And you know, that, that's a little bit of what the gospel is like when he talks about that in verses 9 and 10. That, that in our sin, that we have all gone astray. That's what scripture teaches. Each to our own way that we are sinners, that we are broken, that we are lost, that we are spiritually dead, that we are blind, and that Jesus has come to bring us back into his family, right? That's the gospel, that he's died on the cross, that he's made us pure, that he's conquered it in the resurrection, that he's given us righteousness so we can be back into his family. And you know, when we're in his family, that's not just in eternity. That that is in heaven that we will experience that fully, but we get to experience that now in the body of Christ that we get to be family. That's what we have in Jesus. So if you've never believed in Jesus, do that today. Welcome to the family. Trust in him. Call on his name. Now he has come to bring you home. If you have believed in Jesus, then turn to him. Ask for his help to live out God's word. He says he's, in, he's given us the Holy Spirit. He's empowered us. He's equipped us for everything we need in life to live this out. Ask for his help. Will you close your eyes? Will you pray with me?